Good day, brothers and sisters, and welcome once again to the CMI School of Christ. And we're just going to go ahead and continue with our class, The Great Mercy of God. Uh, last week, we were looking at the passage in Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 13. And we didn't, uh, we didn't actually get to the end of verse 13. And pretty much, we just covered the first two verses. And today, we're just going to see if uh, we can go ahead and I guess get to the end of the passage with verse 13. But as I was just mentioning uh, last class, just in this passage, that right here in this one passage, actually you, you can just see it throughout the whole entire scripture because it's the testimony of Jesus. You just see the whole purpose for which God created the soul of man. And for coming unto that purpose necessitates new birth where God can bring a soul into the house, into the creation of God. And he does this with one purpose, to show the light of the house, the light of the creation of God. And on my diagram behind here, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't think I had a diagram for our last class, but uh, for this class, I just wanted to kind of draw the diagram. I always draw the eternal cross, which separates above and below. And then where the eternal cross is made manifest in the crucifixion of Jesus. And just one of the things that I, I really wanted to just kind of see if I can't get it in, into our thinking is that everything below, and when, when I say below, it's, it's what, you, what you see with the natural eye. It's everything in the natural realm. This, this natural body, this natural tent is below. Okay, everything that can be seen by the natural eye, heard by the natural ear, understood by the natural brain is from the natural creation below, all right? And all that is, is complete darkness. It's darkness because, it's not darkness because we don't know things. It's not darkness because we don't know scriptures or messages, or teachings, or doctrines, or anything else like that. It's darkness because we do not see Christ, all right? Above is light because above is Christ himself. In our last class, I mentioned, or at least I think I did, uh, that for one to be born again, it is a miracle of God. The, at the new birth is a miracle of God. It takes a miracle of God for a person to be born again. Well, in like manner, it also takes a miracle of God to see the new birth, to see the one who is now present, to see the life of the soul, to see the salvation of the soul, and you can go on and on, the righteousness of the soul, the peace of the soul, all these things, all these terms, I guess you could say all the terms of the scripture or all spiritual terms, it takes a miracle of God to see his son, Christ himself. And seeing his son is light. And I don't want to say light in a sense of like a natural light, like these lights right here, is, is, is nothing like that. Uh, it is in the light of his countenance. It is always a person, not a, what's the word? Not an in, inanimate object, no, 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 no. It is always a person seeing the Son of God is having light, is having vision. Seeing anything else is darkness and blindness. And that's all it is. Uh, I, I did mention that uh, just concerning the scripture. And I'll just say this. We can read the scripture and still be blind to Christ himself. And I'll, I'll use this, this example. Saul of Tarsus, before he was born again, he read the scripture. He was a Jew. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. 
He was a Pharisee. He, stuttered, he studied under the greatest teacher of all time, Gamaliel. He knew the scripture. He memorized scripture portions, probably the whole entire Torah. I'm not sure. I've heard it said that that's what one of the things that the Pharisees requirement for the Pharisees were, was. But they would just ex exact, extract, that's the word, extract minute details of the scripture and debate about them. You know, because it's so important. Everything hangs on just the slightest detail of the scripture. Well, even doing all of that, even searching as he searched, he was still blind to Christ. He was still blind to the Son of God. He wasted the church in ignorance because that's what he confesses later. What I did, I did in ignorance. I didn't know what I was doing. But because he did not know the Son. He did not see the Son. All right? So all that is darkness below. Um, and only seeing Christ is seeing the light of the house. And we're just going to talk a little bit going further on here. Oh, that's where I mentioned it. Uh, just with those passages, because I did mention them during the last class, and I've kind of touched on them this class. Uh, once again, Jesus mentioned that the purpose for those who enter into the house and the purpose for those who are in the house is to see the light of the house. And those, are, those passages are found in uh, Luke, Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through, 4 through 17. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and read it. <clears throat> and when much people were gathered together and were come, uh, come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell on the wayside. By the wayside, actually, he goes with the sower, the parable of the sower, and from there he goes straight in to this lamp. So I don't want to go, I don't want to take the time right now to cover the whole parable of the sower, but it has to do with this lamp. So I just want to pick it up in verse 16, and let me just go ahead and just mark that there because it wasn't in my notes to pick it up with verse 16. So verse 16, uh, Jesus, right after he says this, but on verse 15, but that on the good ground are they which in honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Immediately he says, no man when he lighteth a candle, cover it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. All right? Another passage is still in the Gospel of Luke. This is uh, chapter 11. Whoops. Verse... Where is it? Verse 33. Yeah, I think I just I think I just looked at the whole entire passages in context and but we don't want to look at the whole of them right now cuz if not we'll never we'll never get to verse 13. And so Luke chapter 11 verse 33. No man when he hath lighted a candle, putteth it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. The light of the body is the eye, therefore when the eye is single, thy whole body is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. If the whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. Okay, and then our last passage in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. All right, so the purpose for those who come into the house, the purpose for those who are in the house is to see the light of the house. All right, now because it mentions the candlestick, what I want to do is just 
uh, whoops. I want us to look at Revelation chapter 1, the book of Revelation chapter 1, starting with verse 10. And this is uh, the Apostle John on the island of Patmos, and he says with verse 10, it's very specific, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I'm in reality, and I'm governed by the Spirit, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches, and then it goes on. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, okay? Verse 12, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And I've heard it said that basically the seven golden candlesticks are the church that have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And once again, uh, when Jesus says, I'll just throw this out there, when Jesus says, you are the light of the world, what he basically says is this, you have the testimony of God, which is the light. Remember Jesus called John the Baptist a bright and shining torch, and he said, you rejoiced in his light for a season. The only thing that John the Baptist had was the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's all he had. Remember, the, the whole summation of John's preaching was wrapped up in these two uh, verses, these two sentences. First, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, and then behold the Lamb of God, now apart from sin unto salvation. This is the light that he had. The light that he had was the testimony of Christ. So right here, uh, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And here you have the church with the testimony of Jesus Christ, declaring one, declaring one, all right? And verse 13, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the, to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Uh, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And then it goes on, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun, as the sun shineth in his strength. Okay, so a beautiful description of Christ in the form of light. But see, right here, and I love this too, and I, I guess it's just the purpose of everything of God, and in the, verse 13, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. And see, not only in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 13, do we find the whole purpose of everything of God and the purpose for which God created the soul. Everything, everything, how should I say it? That unto which everything is moving toward, Okay. The scripture given of God as the testimony of Jesus Christ. The testimony designed of God to bring unto the person of Christ. All right? In the book of Revelation chapter 1, we just read it. Here is the testimony of the church, the seven golden lampstands, the seven lampstands. There you, you see the church with the testimony of one. And their testimony is light unto those who are in the house, unto those, unto the world. Because remember, everything below is darkness. Everything below is darkness. If our heart, if our heart continues below the gaze below, then it's just complete darkness. Even though there may, there may be truthful facts, it's darkness. Once again, because it is not beholding Christ himself. All right, so here you have, uh, with, with Revelation chapter one, you have the testimony of the church. But see, the testimony of the church is for one purpose. And praise God that John came to the end, or shall we say, not end like as the finality of it. No, the end, the purpose of the testimony of the church. And that's found right here. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. 
everything directing and bringing unto the Son of God. Now, in the book of Ephesians, uh, Paul declares this, that God brought all, well, let me see if I can find it real quick. I'll just do a quick search, see if I can't find it. Let's see. Yeah. It's in Ephesians. It's great. Ephesians chapter 1. And I'll just mark this down. Ephesians chapter 1, verses, we'll just go ahead and start with verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Has nothing to do with man. This is all of God and God alone. All right? That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. Gather everything up into one man in Christ himself. And see, this is what he does. He, all, all, God is always bringing everything unto his son. He... He shows it with the type with Noah. A whole entire creation comes unto Noah, right? And then coming unto Noah, that whole first creation comes to an end, and then you find a new creation in Noah. But God is always doing this, bringing everything unto his son. And this is actually what he did when Jesus was crucified when, when, when he declared, it is finished. It is consummated. The consummation of all things has come. God has brought all things, everything, into the person of his Son. All right? So once again with Matthew chapter seven, 17, verse 1, after six days, Jesus taketh. God has already brought all things in unto the person of his Son. And now he continues by his spirit, bringing our heart unto his son. For the one uh, who's not born again, the spirit of God is working, preparing the ground of the heart, preparing the ground of the soul, that the heart, that the soul may hear the voice of the son of God and that it may, and those who hear shall live because Christ is that life, all right? From that moment, the Holy Spirit continues. And see, at, at the moment of new birth, our souls have been brought unto salvation. Our souls have been brought unto life because our souls have been brought to Christ. Our souls are brought unto salvation because the salvation of God has appeared in the soul. And just uh, for mentioning that, I do want to say this, that nothing happens. Nothing of eternal weight, nothing of eternal value happens until Christ appears. That's it. And everything is, everything of God is, is working towards that. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, working towards that, okay? I'll just use this example with uh, Israel in, in Egypt. God sent plagues. God did miracles and signs and wonders, and they were still in Egypt. Nothing happened, though God did several miracles, signs, and wonders. I mean, the frogs out of the river, the river turned to blood, fiery hailstone, the locusts, all these things, plagues, miracles, signs, and wonders, and they are still in Egypt until, until the Lamb appears until Christ himself appears. At that moment, everything changes. Now, Israel was brought at that moment from death unto life. In the death of the Lamb, they came in, 
with the blood upon the doorposts and lintel, they entered in. Then they came into the burial with the, with the Red Sea crossing. All Israel came in and in type all Israel, all death, or excuse me, all Egypt, all death came in as well, except one came forth, the son. And now you have, now you have Israel in the wilderness. And with the tabernacle, which we'll probably be getting into these next coming classes, with the tabernacle in the midst of Israel, you have God in the midst. You have God in the midst of his people. And even though they are out of Egypt, even though they are out of death, they still continue in their hearts governed by a Pharaoh that is not present. They still continue as though nothing has happened, though everything has happened. The, um, the verse, actually I have it written down here. It's Exodus 19, verse 4, and I think uh, Julie was mentioning it earlier before the class. The Lord tells Moses to tell the children of Israel this. He says, you saw what I did to the Egyptians. And see, this happens at the moment, at the moment of new birth. This is, this, God is about to declare reality. You saw what I did to the Egyptians and how that I bear you on eagle's wings unto myself. And see, that's the thing. God always drawing unto himself, unto the Son, unto Christ. Jesus said it this way, no man can come to me except the Father draw him. But if the Father draw him, he will come. And this is reality. This is the reality of at the moment of new birth, that our soul has been brought from death unto life, unto Christ himself who is life. Now, that's reality. But what is it that is governing our heart? What is it that is governing our heart below? Is it reality or is it what we believe or think or what we have been taught or what we have learned or whatever? See, because the children of Israel, once again, they were in the desert, they were in the wilderness, and I call it the wilderness of ignorance, though God was present in the midst, the type of the tabernacle, his, his presence is right there. All Israel continues governed by what they remember, by what, listen, by what was and God doesn't declare what was. He declares what is. What was was before you had life, before Christ was present. What is is Christ himself. The children of Israel in the desert, they said, oh, here it is, we remember the leeks, the onions. Do you see? And I remember once I was thinking about it, um, just because I was reminiscing, listen, the good old days. And there's no such thing. There's no such thing as the good old days. I was reminiscing a time when I had no life. God declares what is. He does not declare what was. See, and we always want to do this. We, I mean, he even states it in, in, uh, in the Old Testament. He says, don't go necro necromancing. And all that means is raising up the dead what God has put away and consulting with it, conversing with it. God is not a necromancer. God, Listen, God is not a necromancer. He will not... How shall I say it? He will not agree with our ignorance. He will not agree with a lie. He just declares the truth. Remember, he does not declare what was, he declares what is, and more specifically, who is. So, back over here with uh, Matthew chapter 17, verses one through three. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up 
into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. Once again, God initiating, God doing this, God always taking the initiative and doing what man cannot do on his own. And he does this in his mercy and his grace because he knows man is completely powerless. All right? Now, <clears throat> going on with verse 3. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias, talking with him. And I've read different commentators, and they've said that basically it is like there you have the law with Moses and the prophets with Elias, with Elijah, and Jesus. So you've got the law and the prophets, and you have Jesus. So several different commentators agree with that. And just the way I wanted to kind of look at it was basically this, is that here you have the summation of the law and the prophets. Here you have, listen, the testimony of the law and the prophets, Christ himself. Here you have the light of the law and the prophets. Here you have the light of the scripture, the light of the testimony, Christ himself. But it's Christ in the testimony, okay? Uh, and behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Okay. Peter recognized something that he didn't recognize before. He recognized it was good. I mean, think about it. Peter, to whatever degree, and probably the other apostles, disciples as well, they were there, present, to whatever degree, they began seeing Jesus in the midst of the law and the prophets, in the midst of the whole entire testimony. They began seeing Christ. And this is good. This is very good. All right? Just remember this. God gives the scripture as the testimony of Jesus Christ. The testimony is designed of God to bring unto the person of Christ. So seeing Christ in the testimony, seeing the testimony of the Son of God is good, but it is with purpose. It is designed of God to bring unto the person himself, unto the person. Uh, I think it's in the Psalms where the psalmist says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. And right here, they are beholding the lamp of the testimony, the lamp of the scriptures, a light unto my feet, a, excuse me, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's implying motion, path motion with a destination, motion with a destination, with a purposed end. And all that is basically the heart turning unto the Lord. And here, we're just going to go ahead and keep on reading this. And, uh, excuse me, Peter says this, let us make here three tabernacles. And I just jotted this down. It's kind of like Peter saying, this is it. We've arrived. Let's just establish this as being what it's all about. Let's, you can hear, you can, you can hear it this, this way. Let us capture the moment, right? Three tabernacles, make them abide. Tabernacles for abiding, for remaining. Peter and the other disciples, possibly, I don't know, it doesn't say, they could have seen this as the whole purpose for everything, as the whole apex of for everything, as the goal. It's like, oh, we have seen Jesus in the midst of the law and the prophets. That's it. And we are on a high mountain. That's it. Glorious. It's very glorious. And yet, there is him who is more glorious. Because this, the testimony is declaring a person, a real person. The testimony which is a picture 
a type, a shadow, but it is a light, is actually declaring the true light, the true person, not, not, not a shadow, not an example, not a picture, but the substance himself, the true person himself. So, though as glorious, glorious as it is, seeing Christ in the, in the law and in the prophets, in the testimony, we find verse 5. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So you have this real beautiful picture, God bringing, God bringing those who are his, right, unto himself. Remember, reality brought you with eagle's wings unto myself. That's reality. The soul is found in salvation because the salvation of God is found in the soul, Christ himself. And now God must bring the heart unto where he has already brought the soul in reality. God must bring the heart. Well, God desires to bring the heart in knowledge unto where he has already brought the soul in reality. To bring the heart out from unto. Just like Abram. Remember, with Abram, at the very beginning with Abram, uh, Stephen mentions it in Acts chapter 7. The God of glory appeared unto our father, Abraham, while he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said, Get thee out of thy land and from thy kindred and come unto a land that I will show thee. And then in uh, Genesis 15, we hear God himself saying, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees. This happens moment of new birth. God does this, brings us out. And yet, also in Genesis chapter 15, we, we see this, this passage where it says, And the Lord brought Abram forth abroad. And the Jewish commentators agree that Abram was brought outside of this natural realm, outside of the realm of natural sight and natural sound and natural comprehension. Uh, I think one of them mentioned that his something like, or maybe I mentioned it, I'm not sure, that his heart was brought forth abroad. Because natural eye hath not seen, natural ear hath not heard, and it is not entered into the heart of man that which God has prepared for him. But God has revealed unto us by his Spirit. Being brought out of all this unto where our souls have been brought already at the moment of new birth. Everything, everything, everything directing unto Christ. Everything, everything. Uh, <clears throat> so right here with uh, Peter, James, John, here is Christ in the testimony, Christ in the law and the prophets, and yet there is something greater than seeing Christ in the law and the prophets. A bright cloud overshadows them. Behold, a voice out of the cloud. See, cloud, th just cloud above. When you say the term cloud, you don't think beneath. No, cloud above. A bright cloud overshadowed them. A voice out of the cloud. The heavenly declaration, that which comes from above. An eternal declaration. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him always drawing unto one, always bringing unto one. At that moment, God himself is bringing these from seeing Christ in the law and the prophets, from seeing Christ in the, in the, in the testimony, to seeing the substance himself, Christ revealed. coming not unto the message 
not unto the teaching, not unto the doctrine of it, but coming unto the very person himself. See, the Apostle Paul was not declaring messages, a message that he got from God, or a message that he heard and learned somewhere, and so he thought it was good, and now he's going to repeat it and declare it wherever he goes. The Apostle Paul did not declare a teaching. He didn't declare a new doctrine. No, no, man makes all these things. What he, what the Apostle Paul was declaring was the one he was beholding again and again and again and again. Remember the book of Revelation chapter one, we just read it a while ago, the Lord telling John on the Isle of Patmos, he says, write what you see and send it unto the church. Declare what you see in the form of a letter of writing and send it unto the church. And he beholds one as the Son of Man. He beholds the true light in the midst of the church. Verse, oh, verse 6, And when his disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them. And see, this is the thing. It, 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 is, it always requires the Lord, and I love this. Uh, no man can bring any other man unto Christ. Impossible. Only God can. No man can declare, can truly declare, Christ. Only God can. This is what he did. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That is the work of God. In the same manner, it's also the same thing as no man can reveal Christ to any other man. All man has, all the church has, is the testimony. The testimony of him whom they are beholding, if they are beholding Christ himself. If they're beholding something less than the person of, of the Lord Jesus, something less than the Son of God, something less than the person, then it's a false testimony. And it does no good whatsoever. But remember, the testimony of God, the Scripture, and the testimony of the church, that which should be the testimony of the church, will always direct and bring direct unto the person of Christ. Always. That's the end to which everything of God is working towards. To bring unto the person of his son. He's already done it in reality in the cross. Now, he does it in the heart. Okay. And Jesus came and touched them. And at this moment, the Lord himself, because uh, just with going back with the book of Revelation, chapter 1, John says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. What is he declaring? Not I, but Christ. There's no life here but Christ. And the same thing happens in the book of Revelation that happens right here. And Jesus came and touched them. Jesus himself becomes their strength. Because remember, at this point, they are prostrate on the ground. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. Prostrate on the ground. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise. Do you see? Arise. Everything is directing above. Arise. And yet, man cannot turn his heart unto that which is above. It requires God. That's why Jesus, right there the verse, spells it out. Jesus came, touched them, began, became their strength that the heart may turn to see the voice. In Corinthians, um, I think it's Second Corinthians or First Corinthians, forgive me, it, there's a verse that says, 
but when the heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil should be removed. And for the longest time, I always thought that I need to turn my heart unto God. I need to do this. I need to repent. You know, that, that is, that's true repentance. When the heart turns to the Lord, that is true repentance. The thing with Corinthians, and it's, it's very, you know, wise of God to write it that way, is that it really, it, that I have seen, it doesn't really say who's turning the heart. It doesn't say when, when you turn your heart to the Lord, the veil should be removed. It's not saying who's doing the action. And see, I believe God is doing it. When God turns the heart unto his son, the veil is removed. But we, as long as we think we can do it, then we're not, then we're working contrary to the work of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the work of the Holy Spirit, preparing the ground of our heart, the ground of our soul, so that the Spirit himself may bring our heart in knowledge unto where he is brought, unto where God has brought our soul in reality at the moment of new birth. In the book of Kings, you have uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, and all Israel is just completely abiding in darkness. I mean, they're worshiping Baal. They're worshiping a Lord that is not Lord. They're worshiping a master that is not the true, listen, head. Baal, that's what it is, head, master. That's like husband. They're worshiping their own imagination of what they believe the head to be. So here comes Elijah. It says he, he repairs the altar or builds an altar. And then <clears throat> he basically says this, you know, you guys do whatever you do. And hey, the God who answers, that's the true God. And then, you know, we, we know the story, the, the prophets of Baal, they do all this, they cut themselves, they jump up and down. And Elijah mocks them, he, he does, very crudely, <laughs> very crudely, he mocks them. If you look at the actual terms in the Hebrew, he crudely mocks them. And then finally, it, it says this, that uh, the time of the evening sacrifice comes around and Elijah says, okay. And so he prepares the sacrifice. I mean, he brings, he brings the whole reality of God into view. He prepares the sacrifice, lays it upon the altar. He even says, drench it with water. Make it something completely impossible for man to pull off, but yet it requires a miracle of God. And then before, before everything else, he says that he prays and he says this, Lord God, everything that I have done, I have done according to your word. I have done according to what you have made known to me. And then he says this, make known to your people that you have turned their hearts back again. And then we see fire descending from heaven and consuming the sacrifice. And then the confession of all Israel, the Lord, he is God. God himself turned the hearts of his people back unto him again. God does this. Man doesn't do this. Man does not do this. Now, the testimony of man, of the, I'll just, the testimony of the apostles, I'll use, I'll use it that way so we don't get upset or anything. The, testipo, the testimony of the apostles, the testimony of the church, we find it in the scripture, are all co-laboring with the Spirit of God, are all, listen, serving the ministry of God. It's not their ministry, it's God's ministry. It's the merest ministry of the Holy Spirit. They have just discovered what it is all about. And now they are declaring the same because their hearts have been turned to behold him. So here you have John, praise God, that the, in the book of Revelation, that the churches had the testimony of Jesus Christ. And that is what brought John's attention, the testimony of Jesus Christ. And yet that testimony was directing to the person himself, not to remain with the testimony. No, no, no. Remember, 
just like the scripture given of God, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Motion and an expected end. Motion and also an expected end. And this is coming unto the person of Christ himself, the Son of God himself. If the ministry is of God, it will, without doubt, direct unto the person of Christ. Without doubt. Because that is what God does. Remember the baptism of Jesus. Here you have John the Baptist. Here Jesus is coming to be baptized. And in type, in testimony, you see Jesus coming down into the waters of baptism and coming forth as the resurrection. That, that is what is seen there with the testimony, in the testimony right there when Jesus is baptized. And yet, when he comes out of the water, it says this, the heavens were opened. It doesn't say the waters were parted and out of the waters, no, no. The heavens were opened above, above. Because it is of God. The heavens were opened and he said, and I saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting and specifically says this, and remaining upon him. The Holy Spirit drawing the full attention of the hearts of all those who are there and placing it upon one man, Christ himself. And God declares, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. At that moment, that is what it's all about. At that moment, hearts have come to what it is all about. Remember at the beginning of the class, I, I, I said this, nothing of eternal weight or of eternal value happens until Christ appears. Remember the children of Israel, once again in Egypt, yes, there were plagues, there were miracles, signs and wonders, but nothing happened. They continued in a state of death. They continued in the condition of death until the lamb appeared. And when the lamb appeared, everything changed. They had been brought from death unto life, from the kingdom of darkness unto the kingdom of the son of his love. Now, they were completely ignorant of, of the truth, but the truth is there nonetheless. The testimony declaring it is there nonetheless. Just the same way us who are born again at the moment of new birth, because Christ has appeared in the soul, everything has changed. Yes, but we don't act like anything has changed. And the reason is because we have not seen the change, the person of Christ himself. The eternal change comes to the soul at the moment of new birth. And that change is simply this, not I, but Christ. Not I, but Christ. Remember the Apostle Paul, he wrote and he declared what he saw of Christ. He did not declare a message because a message will not do it. He did not declare a teaching because a teaching will not do it. He did not declare a doctrine because a doctrine will not do it. All he did was testify of him whom he was beholding, of him whom he was seeing. And that testimony was serving the purpose of God. That testimony was serving the ministry of the Spirit. That testimony was subject unto the Spirit of God because it was directing unto the true light, unto the person of himself. All that came out of, with, with, with Paul, all that came out of Acts chapter 26, verse 16. When Jesus appears unto Paul on the road to Emmaus, the Lord says this, I'm going to constitute thee a minister and a witness. And basically he could have said this, because currently you are a minister of what you are witnessing. You are witnessing that which is false, and that is what you minister. 
You witness darkness and you minister darkness. But I have appeared unto thee, and I am going to constitute thee a new minister because you will be a new witness. And then he defines it of this, thy seeing me and of thy seeing me hereafter. He declares the ministry out from the witnessing, the beholding of one of Christ. And remember, even right there, Acts chapter 26, verse 16, it is, it's the exact same thing. It's an explosion, actually, of Genesis 15. Remember, with the covenant between the pieces? That particular covenant, that particular covenant between the pieces with the blood makes null and void, ends all previous covenants before with the establishing of that one covenant. When the Lord appeared in the midst of the pieces, that is the new covenant that governs from this moment onward. Remember also the verse in uh, Genesis 15, verse 1, after these things, things were going a certain way, things were governed a certain way, but now the Lord appears, and it's all different. Now, it's governed this way, or shall we say a new administration, a new government, something new is governing from this moment onward. <clears throat> with Paul, when the Lord appeared, it was no longer darkness governing, but Christ himself governing, light governing. And I just wanted to mention this too, that um, below, when, when our heart, when our affection, I mean, <laughs> Colossians chapter 3, Paul says it, set your affection, set your heart on that which is above, not on that which is below, because according to that which is below, you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. He goes on to say, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then it shall be made apparent, then you also shall appear with him, your soul shall appear with him in glory. In a union, in a relationship that God himself has established. And so, Paul doesn't say, set your affection on that which is below. No. no. Because everything that is below is where man is the object in view. And above is where Christ is the object. The psalmist also said, I lift up my eyes to the hills above from whence comes my help my help comes from the lord the object above is the lord christ himself uh, going on and jesus came and touched them and said arise and be not afraid and this is i, lo I looked at that term and up where it says arise and be not afraid you can also look at it this way Jesus came and touched them and said arise and so then be not afraid and he goes on verse 8 and when had lifted up their eyes and I love it because uh, the King James says, and when they giving man giving man the ability to do it saying man did it uh, I, I tried looking, and maybe I haven't just I haven't looked at it so close enough. But I, I tried looking for the term where, where they is found, and I couldn't find it. Uh, so far, I can't find it. But as I stated, if anything is done of eternal weight or value, God is the doer of it, and it's unto one end, to one purpose, to bring unto His Son. So I'm just going to read this like that, and when. The Lord had lifted up their eyes. In the online Bible, Greek lexicon, that term I, the term eyes is Strong's number 3788. And I wanted to read just a definition in the online Bible, Greek lexicon. It says, the eye, metaphor, metaphor, metaphorically, the eyes of the mind, the faculty of knowing. The prayer, remember, of Paul was, ever since I heard of your faith in, in, in the Lord Jesus, I pray 
that God would grant you, that God would give you, uh, let me see if I can find it. And just read it. It's probably in, in Ephesians. Yes, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, starting with verse 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, he's speaking to the Ephesians, he's speaking to the church, he's speaking to those who are born again, he is speaking to those whose hearts, excuse me, whose souls have been brought unto reality because Christ has appeared in their souls. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, and if he's the Father of glory, that makes Jesus Christ the glory. The Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Remember, not in the knowledge of the deep things of God, no. Not in the knowledge of the spiritual things of God, no. Not in the knowledge even of the scriptures, no. In the knowledge of Him. Because everything of God is directing, is moving towards bringing unto the Son a person. May give unto you the spirit of wisdom, and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. And then it goes on, which he wrought in Christ Jesus. Once again with Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, after six days, the Lord brings the soul unto reality. That is the moment of new birth. There's nothing left for God to do. It is finished. It is consummated. The consummation has come because the soul has been brought unto the consummation of the ages, unto Christ himself. All God desires to do is make known the one who is present in the midst, the one who is present. Matthew 17, 1 through 13, that is the whole apex, climax of what it is all about. The testimony directing unto that very same one. And though man will glory in the testimony of Jesus in the scripture because it is a miracle of God, yes, it is a miracle of God to see Jesus in the scriptures. It is a miracle of God. And yet, it is unto an expected end, directing a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, to come unto the substance, the person himself. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and so then be not afraid. And when, and when had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Now, who is the object before them? Their hearts, the eyes of their hearts, the eyes of their soul, the eyes of their understanding has been brought above and they see no man, no other object in view except Jesus only. Remember, above, the object above is Christ himself. The object below is man. They saw no man save Jesus only. They didn't see themselves good, bad, and ugly. They didn't see the law and the prophets anymore. They didn't see all the stories. They didn't see the message. They didn't see the teaching. They didn't see the, what do you call it, the doctrine? No. They saw Jesus only. They saw what it is all about. All these things of God working towards this one end to see Jesus only, to see him only. And they did. And God did this. They didn't do this. Jesus brings them up. Six days afterward, Jesus brings them up onto a high, what is it, a high mountain, a high hill, something like that? 
high mountain apart. He did this. He brought them. He brought them unto himself. He brought that which is his unto himself. For us who are born again, he brings that which is his unto himself in knowledge because he has already brought the soul in reality at the moment of new birth. It goes on. They saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must come first? Verse 11, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall come first and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already, and that they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Now I just wanted to look at verse 11. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall come first and restore all things. Well, what do you mean restore all things? Restore all things unto their intended purpose. And the all things that are being restored is the all things of God. Everything of God Every, if the thing is of God, it is designed and purposed of God to direct the heart under the person of Christ. When man gets a hold of it and makes a mess of it, puts it in shambles so it can serve some other lesser purpose, the Lord himself steps in and begins restoring. Just like, listen, listen, Israel... In the book of Kings, they were worshiping Baal. They were worshiping a husband that wasn't, or a husband that wasn't their true head, that was not the true husband, a Lord that wasn't really the true Lord. Things were in shambles. Everything was not in order. Everything was in disarray. And what does Elijah do? He comes and sets everything in order, sets everything of God back up, presents the order of it, uh, shows the order of it for its intended purpose. He restores all things of God, makes them known with their intended purpose to direct the heart unto Christ, the Son of the living God. So then the testimony, the scripture, is now seen to be what it truly is, the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the testimony is now working in the heart, preparing the ground of the heart, preparing the ground of the soul, because it is designed of God to bring unto the person of Christ. Now, everything is working as it should. Everything is in order. Everything is restored unto its original purpose, to bring all things unto the person of the beloved Son, Christ himself. And see, this is what takes place in our heart. This is what takes place in our soul. At the moment of new birth, God is using all things, restoring all things by his spirit for one end, that Christ may appear, that our soul may come unto the Lord. That our soul may come by the work of the spirit unto the Lord. Therefore, it is a miracle. Man did not do it. I did not come. The Lord brought me. Even as the Lord declared to Abraham, or to Abram at the time, I brought thee forth out of Ur of the Chaldees, but with purpose to give thee this land to inherit it. And once again, what is the inheritance of, of Abram? Beholding the one who fills the entire land. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, called me by his grace, for what end, for what purpose? To reveal his son in me. Again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And see, everything must, everything, if it is truly ordered of God, and if it's truly the Spirit of God restoring all things in our heart, unto this intended end. Our hearts will come by the work of the Spirit. Our hearts will come in knowledge. 
from the knowledge of man below that governs darkness, ignorance, blindness, call it whatever you want, unto the knowledge of God, Christ himself, the truth. And once again, God does not agree with our darkness. He just declares the truth. He just declares the truth with the intended end that by the Spirit of God, our hearts may turn to see the voice, to see the truth, Christ himself, the one who is truly in the midst. So right here with Matthew chapter 17, verse 1 through 13, you see the whole picture beginning to end of a soul coming by God himself bringing that soul unto reality and then all things of God working towards one end, making known that reality in the person of Jesus Christ. And I use the term reality. This, it, is, it is just this, coming to know the Son of the living God, coming to know Christ Jesus, coming to know Christ, coming to know the Lord. That's all it is. A person coming to know a person that is all it is so may we just present everything that's been shared even here uh, unto the Spirit of God that he would continue using it to prepare the ground of our heart the ground of our soul that the Spirit of God may restore all things in our heart unto their proper end that our hearts may turn and behold the one who is present in the midst. And that the light of the knowledge of the glory of God may appear in our hearts, that we may behold all things of God in the person, in the face, in the presence, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We'll go ahead and end for this class. We'll see you in our next class.